What is joint hypermobility syndrome or benign hypermobility syndrome? Well, it is the most common disorder among the hereditary disorders of connective tissue. What does it mean? It means you are very stretchy. Being stretchy or flexible is not always a bad thing. In many people, in fact, many people actually become successful as athletes, dancers, ballerinas, or yogis because of this condition. But there is a strong association with developing injuries. Being stretchy means that your joints are able to bend further than a normal person. Your joints, such as knee, for example, is only supposed to move in one direction. But when the ligaments get stretched due to an injury or hypermobility, then you're able to go further. And that ends up hurting muscles or ligaments that work to stabilize the knee. And these imbalances predispose us for other injuries in the hip, back, or ankle. Joint hypermobility syndrome is very common in the general population. The estimate is that 10 to 20 percent of people have it, and in some people it only affects one joint, while in others it is present throughout the body. It is more common among women than men. The ratio is about 9 to 1, which means that for every 9 women with this condition there is only one man. It is also very commonly misdiagnosed. We don't study this condition in medical school. Instead, we are taught much more rare and debilitating syndromes called EDS and Marfan's syndrome, which are extreme manifestation of this joint and skin hypermobility. In fact, the joint hypermobility disorder is diagnosed in less than 10% of children on presentation to the primary care doctor, which in turn means that there's a delay of treatment. Now, how do we diagnose, diagnose this syndrome? To make a preliminary diagnosis, I use something called Biden score in the office. It is a nine-point scale criteria to answer the question of, does this person have hypermobility syndrome? So you ask the patient to perform five maneuvers and then grade them. First, you take a pinky finger and bend it back. To 90 degrees. If you can bend it to 90 degrees or more, then you have one point for one hand, and then you check the opposite hand as well, which is worth another point. Then you take your thumb, you take your thumb and you bend it to your elbow. If your thumb is able to touch your forearm, that's another point. And again, you check the opposite side as well, one and one. Continuing with your arms, you bring your arms to the sides, extend your elbows as far as you can. If your elbows go past 190 degrees or more than 10 degrees in full extension, that's another point for right and left. Now we're up to six points. Next are your knees. You have the patient bent forward, checking to see if their knees hyperextend or bend further than 10 degrees in full extension. That's another point for each side. And finally, you bend forward and ask the patient to bend forward and touch the ground. If you could put the palms of your hand on the ground, that's another point for a total of nine points. So if you have four points or more, that indicates that you have hypermobility. And that puts you at risk for developing injuries with minimal or no trauma. Another sign that I use in the clinic often is, is part of, uh, that's not part of Baton score, is the jaw or TMJ, checking for a temporal mandibular joint. And what I do is have the patient open their mouth and I'm feeling for any kind of subluxation or abnormal joint movements in this joint. This test is useful because it checks for hypermobility in another very commonly injured joint. Now, what is the pathophysiology of joint hypermobility syndrome? What is the underlying problem in these patients? And the answer is, we don't know. The molecular or microscopic problem hasn't been identified yet. The suspected cause is that it is a disorder of collagen, which is a type of a protein that holds bones together, like glue. When this collagen is defected, ligaments, tendons are weak and don't hold the bones in place as well as they should. And that is what puts the person for increased risk of injury or not healing well after an injury. The common observations also, also made is that joint hypermobility syndrome in, is transmitted from one generation to another generation by dominant inheritance, meaning you will usually inherit it from one of your parents. The manifestation is also variable among family members. And what that means is that 
the severity of the system may differ from parent to child. One may be more affected than the other. Other, other commonly associated symptoms are poor proprioception or being a little clumsy, poor sleep due to chronic pain, bowel dysfunction such as irritable bowel syndrome, going too much or not enough, and anxiety. So how and why do people with benign hypermobility syndrome show up in my clinic? Many reasons, but most commonly as a sports and spine doctor, people present to me with recurrent sprains and strains. A sprain is stretching or tearing of ligaments, ankles being the most common location, and a strain is stretching or tearing of a muscle or tendon. So a common patient I get is an athlete or a former athlete who has a history of ankle instability and pain. It maybe all started uh, three years ago when she was uh, when she had a sprained ankle during a game. Afterwards, it was mostly resolved with some rest, some ice, and some anti-inflammatory medication. Unfortunately, a couple of months later, it happened again. She twisted it again, but this time it took a little longer to heal. Then it happened again. And and again, now she presents with pain on the outside part of the ankle and a constant feeling of her ankle giving way. She's afraid she's going to sprain her ankle again. On exam, typically what I find is that she has tenderness on the outside part of the ankle, positive anterior drawer test and teller test, which indicates that her ligaments are injured. The bones usually are not held in place together well enough by the ligaments, either because the ligaments are partially torn or because they're stretched. And so in this patient I would use the Biden scale and find that she has hypermobility in both her knees, her ankles and her back, giving me a score of 5 out of a 9. So the, the diagnosis is chronic ankle instability, but the underlying pathology that caused it or put her at risk was benign hypermobility syndrome. So what do we do next? Well that depends on what was done prior to the visit to me. Physical therapy is a first and a very effective way of treating ankle instability because it strengthens the muscles around the joint. If that didn't work, then I might get an MRI to make sure that there's no complete tears of the ligaments that might require surgery. If there's only partial or tear or if the MRI is completely normal, that's when I would consider prolotherapy. Prolotherapy is a fantastic way to treat chronic ankle instability and many other joint problems as well. Through a series of injections, both on the inside and the outside part of the ankle, the joint is stabilized, tightened, and strengthened, returning it to its normal function. So for our patient, it took three visits, one month apart, to fix the, the, the problem. In general, for chronic ankle instability, the success rate with prolotherapy is over 85%. So it's a fantastic procedure to do for both chronic ankle instability and for other joints in patients with benign hypermobility syndrome.